I would like to call the May 27, 2020 regular meeting of the Fenton Community High School. How do we move the chat out? 100 regular board meeting to order. Click on it, Patty. I'm sorry? Keep going, Paul. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Um, may I have a roll call, Mary? Yes. Yalloway? Jalloway? Here. Peyton Howell? Here. Here. Figueroa? Here. Rico? Here. Ramirez? Here. King Paul Paul? Wiedemann? Here. Here. Okay, we, uh, we have a quorum. Uh, please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, to, pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. For all. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, James, please read our Fenton mission, belief, and bison way statements, please. Sure. Our mission statement sta states cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationship. Our belief statement successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engage learning, school and home collaborative effectively. We provide a safe, secure, and caring environment. We infuse social emotional learning into academics and culture. Diversity empowers our learning and community. We prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibilities. The Bison Way. Students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, empathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together, and hold each other to high expectations to become the leaders and innovators of the future. Thank you, James. Um, we will now open the public hearing regarding the application for waiver or modification of state board rules and or school code mandates to waive a portion of section 27.6 of the school code to allow driver education to substitute for one semester of physical education. Presentation of legal notice of public hearing published in the Daily Herald newspaper on Wednesday, May 13th, 2020, along with the required notices posted on Fenton's website 14 days prior to this meeting. Email notification to FEA and Floss unions seven days prior to this meeting. Advance notice by U.S. mail to our local state legislative officials. Presentation and discussion of the proposed application to waive a portion of Section 276 of the school code to allow driver education to substitute for one semester of physical education. Questions and or clarifications are in order at this time for any persons in attendance. There are no individuals uh, attending on the uh, public hearing uh, meeting, so there's no visitors uh, wishing to speak. Okay, thank, thank you, Jim. Um, then if there are no further questions or clarifications, I announce that this public hearing is now closed. Okay. Does that include us? Are we part of that public hearing? You, you are part of the, I'm sorry? Are we part of the public hearing? Yes. Okay. I um, I just, I think that there needs to be clarification. So James, if you could do the same for me that you did, or do the same for everybody else that you did for me, because I was under the understanding, you know, that driver's ed was already part of the PE curriculum. And so could you clarify for the public or whoever's gonna watch this, what? Absolutely. what the, what the driver's education program is changing into. 
Absolutely. What we had in the past, uh, basically, is uh, eight weeks of driver's ed, as well as eight weeks of PE. So students, usually their sophomore year takes eight weeks of driver's ed, then eight weeks of PE. That equals to one semester. What this waiver does, basically, Patty and the rest of the public, is that driver's ed now becomes a semester class. That's the difference. Okay, so they're not going to take eight weeks of driver's ed, then eight weeks of PE. It's just driver's ed. What does that do? So what's the remaining? What? How do we beef up driver's ed if you want to look at it? There are many other things that we could do during that time, whether it's uh, roadside safety, uh, flat tires, uh, inflation of the tires, uh, texting and not driving. So we could beef up uh, truly our driver's ed program. Uh, that's how it's different. It also opens up our students to take more electives um, in some sort of way. So they, they are not obligated to take a PE class. Part of this too, uh, Patty and, and the public, is that it's part of the compliance. Um, for us to have this program, it has to be approved uh, through a public hearing. Thank, Thank you, you, Jane. Yeah, any, any other questions? Or clarifications? Paul, you froze. Okay. Paul, you froze for a second. Oh my God. He still froze. Uh oh. I think James is frozen too now. Okay. Yeah. I'm here. Oh. So then there's no, James, can I just ask a question? Yes. So then there's not an issue with uh, the kids not getting enough PE. What they will have in three and a half years is enough because they've got a full semester of driver's ed, correct? That's correct. There were still in compliance. That would be a waiver to replace one semester of PE with driver's ed. So we are in compliance by the state. That's a great question. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry, my screen went frozen, so I only caught the tail end of that. But I just want to make sure that there are no further questions. Did I miss that? That's correct. No. Okay, we're good. Okay. Then, um, James, do we, do we have any requests for public comments? I am looking at my email now as requested. We do not have any public comments. Okay, thank you, James. Please share the student recognitions with us for this evening. Just real quickly, we want to recognize the wrestling team. Um, uh, uh, Coach uh, Brian Hastings has prepared a video for us that uh, Jim will display to everyone. Just want to put out there that um, one of our board members' nephew is a star wrestler for Fenton, and I just want to recognize that. Danny Ramirez. Yay, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm Brian Hastings, um, the head wrestling coach at Fenton. We'd like to thank the Board of Education, the administration, and the staff of Fenton for their support and recognition of our, uh, our outstanding athletes. Um, so we have Quinn Wilcox and Jeremy Pischkorsch, and Danny Ramirez could not join us. Um, Jeremy Pischkorsch was a state qualifier uh, last year in 2018-19. He was not recognized, um, but had an outstanding career, uh, had 95 career wins, two-time conference champ, three-time regional champion, and a two-time Fargo national qualifier. Uh, so Jeremy had an outstanding career. Danny Ramirez uh, was a three-time conference champion, had 109 career wins, two-time regional champ, and three-time Fargo qualifier. He uh, won two matches at the state tournament to place him to finish in the top eight of his weight at state this year. Uh, Danny and Jeremy are both junior or seniors. I wish they were juniors. Um, they, uh, throughout their four years in the lineup, the fence and wrestling team had a, a record of 82 and 14, won three regional championships and two conference championships. So uh, they had outstanding careers. And then Quinn Wilcoxon is a junior in his third year of wrestling. He was a sectional champion this year. 
um, which is very impressive. Had a 32-9 record, 25 pins, and then finished in the top 12 in the state for his weight class. So uh, awesome year for him, and we expect great things from him next year. And then Jeremy and Danny will be wrestling in college. Jeremy at Coe and Danny at Wisconsin Oshkosh, and they're going to thrive there. So um, thanks a lot for your guys' support. You guys want to say thanks? Quinn? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the recognition, and thank you for the support. Really yeah. appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate, um, you know, that people actually know about wrestling. It's actually something that, you know, we strive for is to get our names out there, you know, and that's also one of the reasons I do wrestling. And I thank you for the recognition. It means a lot. Appreciate you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Hey, awesome. Okay, thanks a lot. That's, that's it. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Guys. <laughs> thank you, Coach. Thanks, guys. And then uh, you, Coach. when I'll see you in a little while, all right? All right. Hey, see you, Jeremy. See you, Casper. Nice seeing you, buddy. See you, guys. Good seeing you, too. Later, guys. Have a good one. Bye. See you. Where's Thank the you. picture of them? I didn't see it. Did you see it, Michelle? Yeah, I got a picture of all of us with them on the screen, too. Okay. You do. We, I'd love to do that. We had some technical difficulties uh, to show the video, but at least we have the audio. Okay. I saw the picture. I saw the pictures, too. What's oh, you saw I yeah, I did not see the. I didn't see him either. either. I didn't see the picture. Okay. I'll send it to James. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, then let's um, move on to the district reports, please, James. Sure. The first one really is about a the Board of Education meeting dates. Uh, as you all know, we had two choices, option A and option B, overwhelmingly option A1. Just a quick description of option A. Instead of the uh, fourth week, I'm sorry, the fourth Wednesday of each month, the board decided to go with the third week, third Wednesday of each month. Uh, there are some uh, months like July where it's the fourth week. Uh, you guys have a copy of the schedule. Uh, this will be uh, voted on uh, during the consent agenda. Moving on to the next slide, uh, just really a COVID update report. Uh, the first slide should show, I don't see the it there, I hope you see it, uh, what's posted. It should be a slide uh, basically saying how many um, cases are in the United States, about 1,600,000 uh, cases with over 98,000 uh, deaths. In DuPage, there's 6,467 positive cases and 331 deaths. We receive this um, the report on a daily basis, so we're constantly uh, monitoring the situation. Next slide, slide 14. In general, um, in general, there are. Oh, I'm getting bad feedback. Is everyone getting bad feedback? Yes. Okay, there we go. Uh, what are we doing right now as, as an administrative team as, as a school, if you could hear me? Um, there are three scenarios we're working on uh, for the upcoming school year. The first scenario is remote learning 2.0, a bolstered version of what we have uh, is what we're planning to uh, uh, incorporate. Second one is a, a hybrid program, uh, which is a hybrid learning program, which is a mixture of remote learning and in-person. And obviously the third one is in person. Let me just dive in real quick on this, on the three scenarios. Um, first one is the first scenario is remote learning. Why is it 2.0? Because we want and we will bolster remote learning by providing professional development to our teachers, improving connectivity to our students and improving technology tools. We also want to improve learning for all of our students and to improve our parent communication. We have and will continue to collect and utilize student, parent, and staff feedback through surveys, thought exchange to bolster remote learning. We will work with our staff via task force to bolster remote learning. The end result is a better remote learning experience for all stakeholders. Please note, we are still in the brainstorming and planning stage. The heavy lifting and hard work will start shortly. The message to the board is that the staff are in a forward thinking mode. We want to anticipate any hiccups regarding remote learning and we are being proactive and we are trying to stay a couple steps ahead of the crisis. The second scenario is the hybrid uh, learning model. 
the hybrid learning is a platform of remote learning and in-person learning. So it's a combination of both. It is important to point out that the default of the hybrid learning is remote learning, which we just described, and not in-person. In-person or phase three, four, or five of Restore Illinois framework guidance guidelines has not been constructed by both ISBE or the Illinois Department of Public Health. We are still waiting on these guidelines. As you can imagine, it is challenging to plan for a, a learning platform, platform without a clear guidance or guidelines. Here's, here's what we do know. We have to practice social distancing is number one. We have to wear masks. We have to wash our hands and provide hand sanitizers. We cannot have, we, we cannot have all 15, uh, 1,500 students in the building at the same time during this scenario. And we will, uh, we will need to wait for the guidance from these institutions. With that said, our Fenton state, uh, teams will continue to plan for this scenario as best we can. More to report later. The third scenario is in person, uh, very much like the hybrid. Uh, uh, we're, we're working on it, but we, we have not truly started on that. So more to come uh, at our next meeting. But the message here is that we're being proactive. We're working on these three scenarios. We started a couple weeks ago. We will flush that out as the days go by. Next slide basically is just to give the board and the public a-, a I'm not video. seeing any slides. You're not seeing slides, Jim? Nope, I don't either. Oh, James, I thought you knew that, yeah, we, we're not seeing the slides. I oh, can I see it. At least I'm not. I am. Okay. Yeah. You are. Well, when, you're looking, when you're looking at all the tiles, you can pin the one that has the slides on it. So it's not a Correct. little. Correct. So is it James's slide? Put it in the tile form and then find the small one that has the slides and pin it. Pin it. Correct. That's if you go to the three dots, go all the way to the bottom, and then there's three dots next to present now, and it'll ask you to change the layout, and then you can go to tile form, and then you can it should come up everybody on there and then you can pick the tile one and then there's a little pin and unpin button did everyone see that the three I, see now. I see it now all right thumbs up if you see it all right Jack, you see i see that yep we're all good real all good Okay, so let, if Thank we can back up a couple slides, I think these slides are important. If you could look at the last slide, Jim. One more. We're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and pin that. Thank you. Uh, this slide's really just, I just wanted to make sure we have a visual of what we're working on for at least the board and the public. Here are the three scenarios we're looking at. Remote learning 2.0, once, once again, it's a bolstered remote learning model uh, that we will construct. Uh, the heavy lifting has not started. Uh, that will happen shortly. And the hybrid learning, really small left bubble there is a combination of remote learning and in-person and obviously in-person. Uh, those are the three scenarios. And that's what I've described previously um, before we utilize the slide. Next slide, please. This just gives the board and the public a, a guideline of how remote learning, what we're talking about at these meetings. You know, if we look at the remote learning, that's what we're trying to flush out at this time. Uh, we really haven't touched the, the remaining two scenarios is some of the stuff we're asking is what worked in the spring semester? What, what do we need to deliver differently is the second question. And as you can see, there are different topics that we need to answer and flush out uh, this next couple of weeks to bolster remote learning. What, is, what do we have to do in regards to health and safety, food service, transportation, equity and learning, attendance, extracurricular, lunchroom, gyms, and so forth. And you can read the rest there. So each one of those bullet points underneath, probably there's eight, nine, 10 more action steps behind it. So it's a colossal uh, uh, task. And the first time administrative team uh, looked at this, it was daunting and we needed to really take a time out. Okay, let's break this up in chunks. So that's where we're at in regards to that. Then the next slide, real quickly, uh, spent time on this diagram. Right in the middle is Fenton, okay? And the three scenarios we're talking about, I think it's important for the board and the public to realize that we're not 
in an island, right? We, we are influenced by the governor's office, the DuPage County Public Health, the Illinois Department of Public Health, ISBE, as well as the CDC. We have to find those guidelines. It's difficult to create a scenario when guidelines are missing or guidance is missing. And on top of that, the outer layer, all of these folks, all of these agencies, as you know, is basically influenced by the COVID virus. So I think that's a, 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 an important visual uh, to, to, to demonstrate. And if you take like, for example, the governor's office, they have their own circle of influence. Perhaps it's the federal government, as you know, as CDC and so forth. So I think this is important. I was talking earlier to, to Juliet about this. Um, she totally understand and, and just, just made a comment. Hey, look, we understand that you need guidance and must adhere to those requirements by those other agencies like ISB, CDC, and the governor's office. This, the next slide is another diagram in regards to the continuous cyclical meetings that we, are, we, we take on every week uh, in regards to the COVID situation. At the district level, I have two superintendents meeting every week. Uh, Jovan meets with his principal and our administration, our team here at Benton meets every day. Uh, in regards to municipalities, we meet with Bensonville and Wooddale once a week. And at the state level, uh, we meet with them once a week, the Regional Office of Education, as well as the Department of, uh, I'm sorry, DuPage County Public Health. So we're receiving this information um, every week, fresh information, new information, so we're able to make the right decisions. Next slide, in regards to the COVID update, we are uh, committed to feeding our students and family throughout the summer months. Uh, as you know, summer season has started, so we're serving and distributing food Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, two trucks are coming from Northern Food Bank trunks, uh, one on May 29th, which is this Friday, and the next one is June 29th uh, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Um, uh, and so forth, May 16th. I don't know why I have May 16th and 26th. Okay, just some <laughs> numbers to remember here. The magic number is 40,000 meals. So from March 16th to May 26th, we have served over 40,000 meals, which is outstanding. Our, our recipients and our families and students are very thankful. We're working very hard uh, to make sure our, 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 our kids and families are fed. We have also built a nice relationship with the Wooddale Bensonville uh, Food Pantry. I know some of the board members and myself volunteered our time last Saturday uh, distributing food. Uh, we made contact with the director over there and once a week they will deliver some produce or some milk dairy product uh, for us to distribute to our, our, our families, which is another uh, great resource and relief for our families. Patty, you were gonna say something, I'm sorry. Um, actually, I would because there was another date the food truck was going to be at Fenton, but it was not one of those dates. Remember, it was what last week, but got canceled or something like that, or two weeks yes, ago. Yes, that's correct. That, yeah, that. But was, I think uh, that's just a time. I think that's your time frame of of serving those forty thousand meals. Okay, correct. March sixteenth through May twenty sixth. Yes, March sixteenth to twenty sixth, approximately ten weeks. We served over 40,000 meals, including uh, that includes breakfast and lunches. James? Yeah. Yes. So this 40,000, is this combined with District 2, the 40,000 number, is that just out of Fenton High School? Or is that combined with like the program with District 2 and all of the, all of the schools combined? Or is this just out of Fenton? This is just out of Fenton, Juliet. Wow, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So great job there. We're committed to that. Folks have to eat, as as we like to say here. And the last slide here uh, that I have uh, at this section is just want to recognize three outstanding, excellent teachers there: are newly tenured uh, Christopher Atria, Matthew Lynch, and Jose Mencia. We're very excited for them to become tenured. They're excellent teachers. We're looking for great work, great work from them uh, in the upcoming years. Also for the board to know and public is summer school starts June 8th and ends Ju July 16th, all in remote learning mode. And summer hours for our district here, uh, our campus started this week. It will go from May 26th until August 7th. Okay. 
that's that's my report. I think okay. for now. All right, thank you, James. And I just wanted to add that. Uh, um, so we're all aware that the administration is painstakingly in constant meetings and keeping on top of any new information. And uh, I mean, we should all be proud of them that that they're uh, staying on top of this. And then as well as Bruce with the financial implications that this might uh, have on the district. And, you know, right now, which is a big unknown, but preparing for, for whatever scenario is gonna happen and how that's gonna impact our uh, finances you know, possibly through, you know, more um, uh, sanitation and so forth. Again, nobody knows what path is going to be, but um, they're, they're all keeping on top of it through uh, constant meetings, both in and out outside the, uh, the uh, district. So um, with, that, with that, let's move on to the... Um, Can I ask a question first, Paul? Sure, sure. James, have you gotten a big response from parents as far as the options that you've presented to them? Have you gotten a lot of feedback? I'm sorry, could you say that one more time, Jackie? Have you gotten any uh, a lot of responses from parents about the possibility of the different scheduling or what their feedback is so far? As you know, uh, Jackie, uh, we have put in uh, uh, a couple surveys out, out there, two to our staff, one to our students, and two to our families so far. Um, we have not presented the scenarios uh, to to the families yet because it's, oh, it's okay. incomplete. All, all the communication we put out there to uh, to the public is that be prepared for a remote learning start in the fall. Um, as you know, I I instructed our staff, hey, look, we're look, we're we're bolstering um, uh, remote learning. Uh, expect that mode for the fall semester. I think it gives everyone a a clear picture of what to expect uh, uh, this upcoming school year. But once that is developed, Jackie, we will share that. Right now, we're not there. The heavy lifting, the heavy work will will start shortly. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question, James? Sure. What, what kind of response did you get from the um, surveys about the remote learning that you had sent out? Did you get a, any kind of significant response from that? Sure, I think so. Um, I'm gonna put Michelle here, but I'll start off. He, he ran a thought exchange, great question. As you know, there's two surveys that we ran with parents. Um, one was basically, how was remote learning? That was a regular survey. Um, Three things that the that, take that the takeaway we we wanted they wanted more accountability, more communication, and um, at times depending on the on, on on the parent and the family is it's too much work or too little work. So that's what we're getting. Okay. Uh, in regards to technology, um, there wasn't really some issues. It wasn't significant that uh, in regards to Wi-Fi or connectivity. There were some minor ones, but we were able to give them a hot spot. Michelle, in regards to thought exchange, any takeaways there from parents or the community? Yeah, we had about 150 participants. I think just over 150. Um, probably would have liked to see more. Those who did respond said that their tech need, needs were being met, but they were also responding on a tech platform. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to consider ways to reach out to those um families that have not been fully engaged, um, you know, and uh, with us, um, we're probably gonna do some phone calls and things like that over the next few weeks, but uh, maybe some focus groups. But if, as for the thought exchange, some really good feedback. They said, um, you know, a weekly schedule, one of the, the top four thoughts were all about how teachers could give them an outline of what's expected of the students so they can better support their child at home, which I thought was great. You know, this partnership is gonna be um, essential for us to all be successful in a remote learning setting. Um, and then, you know, accountability came up, like how do we ensure that students are engaged and there's, you know, um, there's an expectation that they're engaged and they won't just get the grade that they were 
earning before this all happened. So, you know, going into next year, we're really thinking about expectations and how to ensure that students, you know, stay with us and stay engaged in their learning. So yeah, really those two items, um, just communication between the teachers with them and the accountability piece. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, if yeah, if there's no other further questions, then we can move on to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, does anyone have any questions and or comments regarding the consent agenda? Paul, real quick, we, we, we still need to do uh, uh, the budget implication for COVID-19. If I could have that introduction. Jim, if you could put that slide up. This is a, there's a couple more uh, before the consent agenda. Real quickly, um, okay. we've discussed COVID-19 safety. We've discussed bolstering remote learning, bolstering SEL in some form, and food distribution. I think it's important for the board and the public to also know that, hey, look, we're also looking at how COVID-19 may impact our budget. So I'd like to introduce Bruce. He worked real hard uh, to, to prepare for this presentation. So I'm going to turn the, uh, the mic to, to Bruce. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. As James said, you know, we've all been working, uh, you know, and, and very aware and, and networking and talking to our professional colleagues and associations to, you know, stay abreast of what's happening because things are, are developing, you know, at a, at a pretty rapid pace. So we wanted to, uh, we went through this presentation a couple of weeks ago with our, our uh, administrators and um, had some good dialogue, good feedback, and we wanted to uh, certainly keep the board aware of what's happening and uh, what we're doing to, um, you know, deal with this uh, kind of circumstances that we're uh, living right now. So. Jim, Jim, there you go. Um, we just kind of wanted to run through the sources of revenue, and, and this is a, similar to a budget presentation, but also uh, it's in real time in terms of what the implications are now and what we anticipate for next year. So real estate taxes, as you all know, that's about 80% of our revenues are real estate taxes. So those are, are critical to the success and operation of the district and functioning operation. Um, we're hopeful that our June collections, and you've probably heard about this in the news and whatnot with um, counties agreeing to, you know, uh, postpone taxes and waive late fees and things like that. Um, DuPage has a program in place where you can apply for it if you have a COVID related circumstance. Um, so we're, uh, that makes us a little bit nervous, obviously. It's, it's, it's good for folks who are, are struggling, certainly, but it's also has an impact on us in terms of our, our revenue uh, cash flow. Um, as you know, you know taxes are paid in in June and and uh, August, September to two primary distributions. Um, so we're we're hoping that our June collections that'll be a real indicator, I think, of of what is yet to come uh, or what we can expect to have come. Um, normally, we have very good, strong uh, tax receipts. Our collections uh, are ninety nine percent or more of taxes, which is really fantastic. So we're very grateful for that in DuPage County and this community in particular. Um, we typically split those taxes over two fiscal years. You know, we get about half in, in now in June, May, June, and then the other half in the fall. So, um, you know, the majority of folks, um, or I should say about 40% of homeowners in DuPage County pay their taxes through escrow. Um, those were told by the treasurer's office of DuPage County uh, to expect um, that should happen as 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 uh, their plan. Um, it's uh, other payments of businesses and whatnot. We're not sure if those are all going to be paid in a, in a timely manner, if there's going to be delays and so on. Um, and then the impact on the future of uh, uh, CPI. You know, there is a lot of talk um, about what that looks like. It's, it's, you know, we're based on the previous 12 months is our levy is, is tied to the CPI and, and what that looks like. Um, but also uh, it's tied to a, uh, a potential property tax freeze as well um, and what that looks like. And that uh, is, would not be great for the district um, to, to freeze taxes being the primary source of revenue. So um, these are all big, big pieces uh, that are the primary source 
uh, of revenues, as I said, for the district. So if we can go to the next slide. Other sources um, are corporate personal property replacement taxes. Those are taxes that we receive from businesses. Businesses are not doing well. They'll likely, uh, see, we will likely see a reduction um, in, in uh, those funds uh, for next year. We budgeted this year about 1.4 million. We expect to receive uh, just about all that. We have received just about all of it. Uh, we're expecting one more payment, um, but that we may be cut by as much as 30, 40, 50%. We're not sure. We're kind of uh, holding our breath right now to see what happens there. Um, earnings on investments, as you can imagine, interest rates are really plummeting. Uh, we expect that to go down quite a bit next year. Reduced food service fees. Uh, as you know, we're we're uh, serving food out there, but we're not doing any a la carte sales or, or full price meals um, for uh, reimbursement. So we will have a reduction in that um, object uh, of fee areas, um, as well as we're projecting not only this year, but next year. Tuition income, not a huge source of revenue for us, but we do uh, expect reductions and will experience reductions this year and next year. And then uh, reduction in student activity fees, athletic admissions, things like that. Those will be uh, are off uh, quite a bit under budget this year and expected to continue next year. So those are the all the local uh, sources of revenues. Now we get into the state sources, EBF. <laughs> That's evidence-based funding, which is what replaced general state aid. Um, we are, uh, we just heard over the weekend that the governor or last week, they, they passed the legislator passed a budget that includes, we believe or understand it to be flat funding, um, which we're, we're pleased about that. If we can just keep it uh, the same, we can live with that, but a reduction in that, uh, cause there, there's been anywhere uh, scenarios with, we, we might get half of what we uh, are expecting um, and that would be not good. We, we get close to $2 million in uh, EBF funds. Um, so it's a, it's a, it represents state aid's about 10% of our uh, sources of uh, revenue sources. Um, and the budget really is contingent, the state budget on the Illinois uh, receiving some federal funds um, of about $5 billion. So uh, they're counting, banking on that and we are banking on that as well. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that plays out. And then the categorical payments, that's kind of our transportation, state aid, special education reimbursements. That we ex uh, expect only two payments this year. They've told us to budget just for two. We learned that about a month ago. Um, and then we're only expecting two payments next year. So, um, you know, again, uh, that'll be a reduction in, in, in uh, that uh, uh, portion of state aid. And then we get into federal revenues, the CARES Act, you probably heard a little bit about that. That's the COVID kind of related funding source that uh, Title I schools, which is what uh, we are, um, we're getting uh, a portion or an allocation based on our Title I funding. For us, it's about $185,000. Um, it does require districts to continue paying employees and contractors. Um, and, and the funds are supposed to, the, the funds are, the grant is opened up now, so we can start applying for that now, but we can use it for things such as uh, professional development, technology to bolster remote learning, um, things like that. Food, we can offset some food costs with that um, and uh, you know other, other things that uh, they've outlined. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement, that's not a huge source of revenue for us, but it, it's, <laughs> thousand um, dollars but with less uh, services and, and uh, reimbursements there um, we expect that to go down uh, this year and next so that's the the, the revenue side of, of what is looking so our, our issues really for next year are more uh, revenue related than they are expense related but uh, we wanted to give a board the, the board a depiction of where we're at and what we expect it to be um, and what we're kind of forecasting right now, although it's it continues to be a work in progress, um, just based on information and developments that come from the state and the federal government. Um, salaries, um, just to kind of go through some of our expenses on, at a high level, uh, we continue to pay employees as, as, as directed um, by this, the state. Um, we do have um, collective bargaining agreements in place through FY21. Uh, we continue to pay stipends. Um, Substitutes, our permanent subs, we are still paying, and our 
bus drivers are being paid as well through the end of this this year. And then our benefit piece, medical insurance, um, IMRF. Uh, we already know what our medical insurance rates will be for next year. We, we shared that at a previous board meeting. Um, IMRF, that's our uh, non-certified staff participate in that retirement program. That will likely increase because that has a direct impact on the economy and earnings uh, implications of interest earnings. Unemployment compensation, this is kind of a growing area right now for us um, as people, um, uh, you know, believe that they will, you know, be out of work. Um, people are uh, are substitutes, for example, things like that. Um, we've seen a, an increase in, in claims and uh, for unemployment uh, uh, compensation benefits. So that that's uh, happening uh, as we speak. Um, the purchase service piece, additional costs for online professional development training. And this kind of flows over not only this year we've experienced some of those costs, but next year as well to bolster remote learning, um, impact to contractual payments for professional services, transportation, custodial food services, all those things will be impacted by by what's what's happening uh, right now with, with the uh, environment we're, we're in. And then we get into some more uh, purchase services with uh, possibly some legal service pieces there, uh, contracted technology, um, reduction in athletic officials, reduction in travel costs, things like that. So there's some positives, I guess, too, where we would see some reductions in, in, in some costs there. Not huge cost centers, but, but nonetheless, uh, we should see some uh, relief there. And then we get into our supplies or purchase services, I guess, uh, as well. Uh, reduction in, in costs for water and sewer, trash collection, um, and then uh, insurance premiums. Um, and we'll get into that actually a little bit later this evening, what that looks like. Here's our supplies. Uh, additional costs related to cleaning and disinfecting supplies, uh, cleaning of buildings and buses. We hope to use some of that CARES Act funding that I talked about a couple of slides earlier to use for our PPE needs as well. So we hope to uh, devote some of the funds towards that. Uh, potential reduction in classroom supplies. Uh, we may see that next year as well. Uh, what what uh, the delivery of education looks like. Um, cost of additional online resources. Uh, potential reduction in athletic supplies and utility costs, which we're experiencing some of that right now with a reduction in uh, both electric and natural gas. Capital projects, you know, we've, we're have we deferring those as, as the board is aware. Um, any major projects we're putting on hold at this point in time. Um, and then impact to tuition costs, special education placements, um, what that uh, might look like going forward um, in terms of uh, that uh, cost area. So that's um, next year. Um, we, expect balance, we budgeted for a balanced budget this year. We expect to continue to have a balanced budget this year. Um, we do expect a unbalanced budget next year based on what we know today. Um, we hope to have better information going forward, um, or I should say more positive information going forward um, in terms of uh, what where we're at with tax collections, where the state aid is at, and where if there's any additional federal sources um, that will be uh, available for districts to to utilize. Um, but we do have a, a, a for 2020, these are, um, you know, projected amounts. So for 2020, um, you know, we're um, at nine months of reserves. Um, so we we're, we're right there, similar to where we were the previous year. We do expect a slight dip in 2021 and 2022, and those are because of a, a, a deficit budgets uh, we're projecting right now, based on the information we know today um, going forward. Um, but again, we'll continue to develop the budget, refine the budget, um, and, and minimize that as best we can, and to keep any reductions that we need to make uh, to not affect the classroom uh, as much as possible. And we're not at that point uh, right now. The, the good news is you know, we do have reserves to cover the shortfall for the next couple of years. So that that's, uh, we're in a far better, stronger position financially than, than many other districts. Um, so I do wanna emphasize that point. We do have the reserves to cover shortfalls um, for, for shorter periods of time. But obviously, you know, if you get into, you know, four or five years, um, some other things would have to happen. 
And then um, the next step, you know, as I said, we're continuing to develop and find the budget for next year. We're, we continue to monitor state, local, federal decisions and the impact on us and what that means. Uh, tighter controls, uh, continue to operate with tighter controls and operating nimbly. Uh, it's probably, uh, you know, J James's mode of operation certainly is uh, operating nimbly. So uh, uh, that's why I kind of threw that in there. And then uh, we'll present and approve the tentative budget um, in July. So that's kind of our timeline, but we will continue to update the board um, at the June board meeting and going forward um, as we uh, work through this uh, this uh, unusual circumstance. So with that, um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. Bruce, got a quick question. You said uh, employees will be paid uh, to the end of the, end of the year. Now, you meant school year, school calendar year, and not uh, the regular calendar year. Correct. That's through yes, through June thirtieth. You are correct, Paul. Okay. Okay. Maybe I misunderstood, but okay. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks so much, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, thank you for staying on top of that. Um, James, are there any other items under the district <laughs> reports that uh, we still need to cover before we go to the consent agenda? No, no, we don't. It's been completed. Thank you for asking. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Um, question. Am I part of this agenda or the? Sorry, you're, you're, I thought you're I leader on Michelle. Hmm? You're leader on Michelle. Sorry. It's okay. We won't forget about you. <laughs> okay. Um, then let's move on to the consent agenda. Uh, do we have any questions or comments for anything on the consent agenda? Just real quickly right there, letter H, uh, CTE summer maintenance hours, if there's any questions from the board in regards to that, that we do this every year. It's basically CTE stands for career and technical uh, education, that's our automotive, our small engines, our, our, our woods classes. Uh, there's equipments in there, heavy equipments in there that needs to be maintained during the summer uh, time. Um, so what we do is basically the, uh, the, the teachers that teach those classes are given hours to maintain, replace, clean those, um, those equipment. Uh, we found out that by doing so, it's, econo it's, much, it's much more economical and our teachers know their equipment much better than the third uh, party. So uh, just wanted to clarify that if anyone had any questions. Okay, Th thank you, James. Uh, then if there's nothing uh, further, uh, may, I, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the con consent agenda as presented? I'll motion that, Paul. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell? Yes. Galloway? Patty, Patty, you're on mute. Patty, you're on mute. Hey, Patty, you're on mute. We're taking a vote. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Pao Pong. Kid, you're a mute. <laughs> Can't hear you. Can't hear you. We can't hear you, Kit. Yeah. Kit, we can't hear you. We'll take a yes if you give us a thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs down means no. Right? How about a thumb? Anything? Yes. Yes, thanks, kid. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. The motion has uh, passed. Uh, we move on to, next to the discussion item only regarding property casualty liability insurance renewal. And Bruce, that one is yours. All right, I'm back again, folks. Um, <laughs> so briefly mentioned earlier in our presentation, um, the property casualty uh, liability renewal, um, what that looks like. I did uh, address a memo to, to James and the board on page 92 of the packet. Um, we belong to an insurance uh, cooperative that includes about 185 uh, school districts, primarily in Northern Illinois, Northeastern Illinois. Um, the program includes, uh, and the sheet there, I think it's a, the green sheet that's included with your packet on the uh, invoice, or basically the outline of the billing. Um, it's broken into uh, the costs for the program are both broken into bro uh, fixed and variable costs, and, and I'll kind of briefly explain what those are. Um, but the uh, fixed are, are just standardized costs that are, are the same rates applied to everyone in the co-op um, based on you know the size of your co-op or your district and uh, vehicles and building values and things like that. And then the variable costs are based on uh, claims um, and actual uh, actual uh, com uh, contributions um, that are required to commit to a, a loss fund. Um, so the premium, is will be eighty one thousand eight hundred two dollars, and that's a combination of the uh, property liability coverages and school board legal and all that. And then we do take on the optional uh, fiduciary liability as well for a, another two thousand dollars. So that's about a seventeen point six percent increase. It seems fairly high. It is fairly high. Um, the areas that are uh, drove that increase really were properties. Uh, the property portion of the, of the renewal at 27, almost 28%, and then cyber liability at 243%. Wow. And, um, yeah, that's, that's that's a big thing, and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit. The property really, that's a that's a boost, um, and it's really a, a sign of the marketplace and the claims that continue to pound the, the industry. Um, catastrophic claims, uh, they're also using what they refer to as convective storm modeling to um, being relied on for insurers to uh, determine rates. Um, increases in sexual abuse claims have been major concerns for insurers. Um, there's, a, there's a list of other items too. The, those are the primary drivers um, increasing the property uh, aspect of coverage. The cyber liability um, is another piece that is, that is huge, growing. Uh, Jim Batson, I know, doesn't sleep most nights thinking about this, but um, you know, ransomware, uh, you know, hijacks of systems and things like that um, are growing exponentially. Um, our base coverage last year was a million dollars. The company decided to uh, that to uh, a minimum of, of $2 million, so they doubled the coverage. They also gave members um, the option to increase it by another million dollars, a million to $5 million. Uh, Jim and I kind of discussed it. We decided, uh, along with James, that we should, uh, just for an added measure of protection, we increased it by another million dollars. So that was about $1,600. But uh, I think Jim might be sleeping a little bit easier at night by boosting it up uh, a little bit to, to have uh, coverage in, in case of uh, uh, you know any, anything like that happening. We, I think we have very good control. Jim can speak to that far better than I can. But um, again, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, determined people out there to, to hack into your systems. If you backed out those two areas of the, the renewal, um, the other lines of coverage is about 6.6%. So that's a little bit uh, more reasonable, I think. Um, but again, uh, the, the drivers really were the, were the property piece and the uh, cyber liability. Um, just on a final note, um, the renewal even though it's it's higher than what we would like to see, we're still less than what we were back in 20 prior to joining the co-op. So I I'm, I did indicate that in my memo just just to kind of have a, a point of reference there to, to uh, for you to refer to. But um, anyhow, this would take place uh, effective July one, and it's for the one year um, this coverage. So that's, that's what that, uh, is, uh, shaping up to be for next year for our property liability coverage. 
Any questions on that? How many are in the co-op? There's about 185 districts, Patty. Is there, you know how right now there's been some relief going on with uh, property and casualty insurance for for people during the COVID era? Is, is there any opportunity for that? Have you heard from the insurance companies about that at all? You mean for like auto insurance and things like that, Kid? Is that what you're referring to? Like the commercials that are- well, it wouldn't, I don't necessarily think, I mean, I, just in general for, for our operations and the, the rest of the school districts that are participating in the co-op, I'm you know, because obviously it's not going to be the same as um, um, the needs of uh, a regular auto uh, policy, but are there circumstances where we're not a higher liability for the insurance companies that the co-ops could uh, leverage? Well, they, they do. And, um, you, you know, I think there, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, actually these insurance companies that they you have utilized, I think, um, uh, I can't think of the name of the, the biggest one we use, but they're, they're having the co-op, believe it or not, as, as big as we are, are, are struggling to even get, uh, some insurance companies to, to, um, uh, you know, produce lines or offer lines of coverage for the, co for the co-op because of the exposure. So I think because of some of the reasons, you know, with the property and the cyber liability and the sexual abuse and things like that, um, there, there's a lot of risk to take on. Um, and their standards are pretty high. They're only going to deal with, you know, A plus rated companies and things like that, insurance providers. So, um, you know, they, they aren't uh, going to go with anything less than that. So I think they have high standards in terms of who they'll engage in coverage or offer allow to, to bid on the coverage. Um, but and and there's there's just a, a, a you know terrible marketplace out there right now with with claims and activity and storms and um, all the other uh, things happening in, in throughout the country. Yeah, I, I get it. Thanks, Bruce. Sure. sure. All right. Thank you, uh, Bruce. And if that was a discussion item only. Um, the next item is the 2020 summer curriculum hours and summer workshop hours. And Michelle, that is that is yours. <laughs> yeah, here I am. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have my board packet printed out. <laughs> um, I um, hi everybody. How you doing? I um, I'm asking for us to consider the um, curriculum hours and workshop hours. Um, and I'm asking for approval on the proposed hours. So I think it's up on the screen. Um, I've outlined it a little bit differently than I usually do because we're, there's some added features into um, how we're handling our summer this year. Um, I'm gonna start us off with the what I'm calling the traditional summer workshop and summer curriculum hours. We usually give curriculum hours for teachers to um, revise their curriculum, work on new courses. Um, if they're new teachers of a course, we give them some time to work through that with a previous um, teacher of that course. If there's new textbooks, we give hours. So um, those are still things that we um, want to support the teachers. And um, although it's uh, not as robust this year because, you know, in some cases we're in a little bit of a holding pattern, but in uh, many cases we don't want to hold anybody back from moving forward and continuing to design design highly effective learning experiences for kids. So you'll see at the top, um, we're going to spend about $19,000 on curriculum development as we traditionally do. Um, and then we usually do workshops, um, but we have canceled um, any of the ones that were on the schedule. There was one for evidence-based reporting. We went ahead and canceled that for right now um, so we can focus on bolstering remote learning. Um, so typically, or last year, we spent about $55,000 over the summer for these traditional type of curriculum hours and workshop hours. And this year we're spending about 19,000. Um, so we, we cut it in more than half of what we usually uh, support. 
Um, you know, that's just being fiscally responsible. We know the state aid is being cut um, and we, we wanna be very thoughtful about how we're spending our local funds because that does come out of local funds. So then in the first table, you'll also see though that we have something that we're doing called COVID curriculum development and COVID um, workshop. This is very specified to bolstering our remote learning efforts. Um, we're going to be using Title and our CARES um, Act funds for this. And we it, it's truly to support our teachers. Uh, every teacher is going to have to do a heavy lift this summer. Um, they have been so far doing a wonderful job of um, shifting and pivoting like on the spot, but we know that it's gonna have to be a lot more um, robust than what we've already been doing. We're bringing on new tools for them and they're gonna have to be trained in those. We're, and they're gonna have to redesign some of their instruction to be online or all of their instruction to be online. Um, and we wanna ensure that they have the time and um, the support to do that. So, you know, we th there's a few areas that we know we're gonna be supporting through workshop. We're encouraging them to workshop first, then move into some of their curriculum development. Um, you know, like I said, bringing on more tools and tech tools that will help um, them bolster their instruction, um, how to support students' SEL needs after a time of being so isolated, what are they going to come back and what are their needs going to be and how are we going to address those in a highly effective way, what are some of the pedagogical approaches that we're going to have to consider uh, brick and mortar school, it cannot just be transferred into a digital format without considering the approach. So we're going to have to support them with the approach and and, and what are the, the considerations we really um, need to look at more closely when we go to a remote type of setting. And then um, the communication strategies. I mean, I said it earlier, our parents are going to be more of a partner than ever before. They're the ones sitting next to their children at home. And how do we ensure that those communication strategies are super strong? So we'll be workshopping on all of those. Um, and we're giving every teacher 10 hours of workshop, um, paid workshop. Um, we'll probably be offering much more than that for CPDU opportunities and things of that nature. Um, but, and then beyond that, every teacher will get 10 hours per course they teach. Um, so let's say a teacher teaches two English fours and three um, English threes, they will get two 10 hour stipends for that because they teach two different types of courses, not for every period they teach, but every course they teach. So we're, we're hoping that really helps them move through this work in a, in a highly effective manner. We're gonna be alongside of them. Our DLs are gonna be there, our instructional coaches, our instructional tech coordinators, um, our SEL committee. Everybody's engaged right now. We're really proud of everybody. Um, nobody's shying away from this challenge. It's, a, it's a, re, a, a relentless challenge, but we're relentless at going after it and making sure everything's really good for kids and families when, they, when, when we get back in the fall. So um, this is part of the effort to do that. And we're gonna, we're putting a lot of money towards it. I mean, you can see on the sheet, it's um, quite a bit of money. It's at a rate of about $25.50 per hour for curriculum development. And it's about $20.25 for workshop hours per hour. So it's a large investment that we, um, we know has to be given and then that we know will have um, high impact in the end. Um, we wanna do this well and we wanna do it right. So. Um, and our teachers are more than happy to engage in this work over the summer. That's their summer. And they've been, they've been in an extreme situation for a while. So for them to continue at this, we're, we're really grateful. Any questions?
Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle. Very, very good, good presentation. Yeah, it is. It's a, it, it is a lot of work because they, I mean, they, they weren't prepared for remote learning. You know, they had e-learning, okay, for a couple of days, but but to jump in and have to do it for you know two and a half three months it's um um i'm i'm, I'm glad that the the uh, training is continuing because there i'm sure the learning curve is still quite um steep um is there a chance for them to collaborate with uh, teachers from other facilities to like share learned experiences and stuff like that as well um, yeah, many of our teachers and our instructional tech coordinators and our instructional coaches belong to professional networks just naturally. And some of um, the professional development we're looking at um, may come from outside experts. So we have some expertise right within our building um, that's very strong that we'll be tapping teachers to teach one another. Um, some are far out there along the continuum, but then the outside agencies, we have um, some of their workshops and webinars are alongside other people from across the nation. Um, we also have been working with two and seven, um, the curriculum directors over there about how to kind of align our forces a little bit and get um, at some of our teachers from two, seven and 100 all talking with one another. So yeah, we're, we're definitely trying to tap in and extend our networks. We're working with um, um, an agency right now called Highlander Institute. They're out of Rhode Island. When um, this all started, they um, this agency helped was contracted with the state of Rhode Island to be a support network for them, and um, they're helping us kind of position ourselves for quality professional learning this summer. And, and um, they have a great network of teachers and. Um, of professionals that are going to help us along the way as well. Yeah. Can you expound at all about like the comments from the parents? And I'm, I'm sorry that there was only, would you say 150 responses uh, mm -hmm. for the e-learning that's been going on this semester. Um, mm -hmm. Like did things that you took away from them uh, that can be worked on this summer? Yeah, we, we just took a deep dive into it today. Actually, the Highlander Institute helped facilitate that discussion with us. They um, pulled all of the data together in a meaningful way for us and with us um, from what the teachers are saying, what the parents are saying, and what the students are saying. And really, um, yeah, we're, we're getting a lot of really good takeaways about equitable practices and, and how to make sure um, you know we're meeting the needs of all of our students, but really the parent ones, it, it wasn't as, um, uh, there was some, it really was focused on how do we set up the right communication system between teachers and families so we can be partners in the learning experience with the students. So um, that's at the foundation of what distance or remote learning is. It's flipping the script. For so long, we've relied just on um, uh, the student, right? They're in front of us, so we, we can rely heavily on them. And now it's kind of flipped. We we need to rely heavily on that that parent piece, um, and we have to figure out what they need and how how we can um, support them and what the expectations are. You know, this isn't homeschooling. We're still schooling, but how can mm -hmm. we help them set up organization systems for them? How can um, we do um, give them the resources that they need? And well, that's what we're trying to pick apart right now. I, I hope that's helpful, Patty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a, a lot of pieces to try to put together. I'm sure. I, I would imagine that this also kind of deepens and allows you to, to um, retool the blended learning curriculum that uh, we discussed in previous meetings and, and how this maybe accelerates it too. 
Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> um, thank goodness we had some um, people already working to that end that could help support others moving forward. Um, and it definitely accelerates it. Uh, you know, and it's not just, like I said, turning it into a digital format. What this is, is thinking about personalizing learning for students. Now we have these ideas of self-paced, and now we have these ideas of um, more relevant and uh, meaningful inquiry that they can drive themselves, drive some of their own learning because it, it can't be that day-to-day -day little activities because that's just not how it's going to work. With, uh, the parents are asking for weekly goals and weekly outlines, not daily as much. They're also asking for structure. Like my kid needs structure. They need to have um, a little less of this like whenever and whatever and more structure within um, some of the planning and scheduling that we're doing. So. Yeah, we're, thank goodness we got a head start kit on some of this learning about it, but it still is um, quite a shift. Yeah, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Michelle, really quick, does do does the um, does these workshops also assist teachers with the changing to a virtual environment? You know mm -hmm. that you know we know over a longer period of time can be taxing and more stressful and unnerving. Is it helping the teachers to, on how to deal with, with that? Yeah, they'll be beyond, you know, teaching them new tech tools that are more robust. Um, there's a, we've always been focused on social emotional learning and social emotional well-being of our students, our families, our staff. So um, we've, we're focused, we'll be focusing on self-care. We'll be focusing on just how to stay positive and connected and continuing to try and build relationships with the students in this type of format and with one another. Um, you know, the isolation isn't healthy for anybody. So, you know, trying to figure out how to still have that social emotional, those social emotional bonds. Um, you know, and, and burnout, we're reading articles, Paul, about it. Um, every day, our instructional coaches and our ad administrators and division leaders are hopping on webinars, reading articles, trying to put all these pieces together, and that is definitely one piece of it. We have to consider the balance in everybody's life and what they're trying to manage right now. I mean, I have a three-year-old at home, too, <laughs> right now, so, you know, it's a lot. Mm hmm Okay. Wow. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Very good. Um, okay. Does anyone have any other further questions? Okay. Then um, may I have a motion that the Board of Education authorizes administration to utilize the requested 2020 summer curriculum hours and summer workshop hours as presented? I'll make the motion. All right. Thank you, Marianne. May I, I have a second? Second. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, roll call, please. Peyton Howell? Yes. Rigno? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Tim Paul Palm? Yes. Jowick? Yes. Figueroa? Figueroa? Leo, you're on mute. <laughs> Leo, you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, the motion has passed. Uh, now we move on. Uh, Michelle, it's you again. We have the new 2020-2021 textbook purchase. Yep. This one's really quick. Um, okay. Yeah, the um, textbooks are, um, we do this every year, our teams review their needs. Um, we encourage the use of um, 
open source where appropriate. Um, we definitely encourage the use of digital textbooks even before this, wor this um, world changed um, like it had. But we have, um, hold on, let me grab my notes. We have four major areas that are focused on new resources this year. Um, world languages, we've been rolling in a new textbook series now for a couple of years. So this is just the third phase of it. Um, it's a really um, strong textbook series, um, all digital. The supplementary resources are very strong. And um, um, so we're bringing in the, the level three books this year. Um, AP is also bringing in an anchor text. I, I like to see that literacy piece coming through a culturally relevant literacy piece. So they're bringing in a novel. Um, English 4 is a brand new course, so um, we had to get some resources for that. They're not working out of a traditional textbook. They're going to be working out of a... Uh... Somebody's got to mute. Um, so the... Um... Sorry. English 4 is bringing on a few novels, just three anchor novels. Um, it's, it's there to... Um, anchor the learning, but there's a ton of supplementary um, nonfiction that they're exposing the students to, um, discipline-specific text as they um, work through passion projects, as we've discussed with English for earlier. Um, math is um, bringing on a new text. They actually have been piloting it in a couple of the areas for the last two years for a very, very low price point. Um, now that we're actually adopting it, it's um, it's kind of a heavy lift, but it's we think it's worth it. Um, it's an inquiry-based um, text, all online again, um, and has a lot of cross-curricular connections. We were able to see the students in action um, using this resource, and they were highly engaged. When we stopped and we talked to them, they said, you know, it's like we're learning science with math, and they were really excited about it. Um, and then... Yeah, the, those are the, actually it was three areas. I apologize for that. I, on my notes, I had one other thing. About. So world languages, English four and um, math is where we're bringing in new resources. And um, we think they're quality and we think that'll help keep the students engaged. And they'll, most of them are digital format, the novel they're not, but that's okay. Kids need to pick up a book and read it um, by hand sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, anybody have any questions regarding the uh, textbook purchases? The, uh, the the language ones, the Spanish, well, Spanish world language, they're good for five years. Is that is, so? Like year mm -hmm. one and one and two, they're still good. The digital formats. Yeah. Yeah, they'll be good for another two or three years, and then we'll have to update and renew. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the new textbook purchase for the 2020-2021 school year as presented? I'll make the motion. I'll Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Marianne. And I'm sorry, who's second? Juliet. Juliet. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howe? Yes. Ramirez? Yeah. Ting Paul Pong? Kit, you're mute. Yes. <laughs> yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, the next item is the, uh, James, is the Board of Education and FEA Memo of Understanding? Sure. Uh, real quick, what that is, is we had a request from the FEA Association to sign an MOU um, in regards to what took place from basically March 16th to May 21st. Uh, as you all know, we had a task force to lead the charge on COVID-19 e-learning, active guide, and remote learning later on. This basically documents the agreement between the district and the association. Um, they're, they're asking for this request. Um, 
I, I support the request. Uh, we, we've discussed it. Uh, I've discussed it with Paul as well as our, our legal counsel. Um, I think we need to go ahead and sign this memo of understanding with the FEA um, as a sign of unity and a sign of support for each other. All right, thank you, James. Uh, anyone have any questions regarding these, this memo of understanding? Okay, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the FEA memo of understanding regarded, regarding COVID-19 uh, spring semester as presented. Thank you. I will uh, make the motion. Uh, thank you, Patty. May I have a second? I will second the motion. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ping Paul Pong? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, the next item is the treasurer surety bond. Uh, Bruce, this, this one's yours. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, last month, as the board may recall, the uh, school treasurer was appointed uh, for the 2021 uh, school year. That was me, thank you very much for that. Um, this month, the, uh, the next step in the process is to approve the mm -hmm. uh, bond for the treasurer. So. Um, we have a resolution for the board to act on tonight. Um, once um, all these documents have been authorized and approved by the board, we will submit it as required by law to the regional office of education. So uh, we're just asking the board to approve this resolution tonight so we can fulfill all the, our obligation regarding these, uh, this process of these documents. Thank, thank you, Bruce. Anyone have any questions? Then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the resolution approving the surety bond of treasurer? I will make a motion. Thank I'll you, second. Jackie. May I, I have a second? I'm sorry, was that Juliet? Yes. Okay, thank you, Juliet. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Yes. King Paul Pong? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay. Next, uh, the, that motion has passed. Next item is the driver education Waiver, James? Sure, this is what we discussed in the public hearing. We're asking the board to approve the driver's education waiver. Okay, anyone have any questions? This was discussed before. Anyone have any questions on this? Okay, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the application to waive a portion of section 276 of the school code to allow driver education to substitute for one semester of phys physical education as presented. I'll make the motion. Uh, thank you, Jackie. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Marianne. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Rago? Julia, you're on mute. Julia, you're on mute. Okay, yes. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Yes. Ping Pao Pong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Uh, motion has passed. Now we move on to the notice and dismissal of certain educational support personnel. Uh, Sam, could you please present? Yes, we have one individual listed on the report that uh, we are not renewing for next school year. 
and simply just ask for uh, this non-renewal to be approved. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, anyone have any questions? No. Okay, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the resolution uh, resolution authorizing notice and dismissal of certain educational support personnel as presented. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? I will second. Uh, thank you, Patty. A uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Ho. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Rago. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. King Fel Pong. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Sitting in there. We did well. Uh yes. Yes. Okay, motion has passed. Uh last item is uh the twenty twenty Chromebook Chromebook purchase. Jim. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, Jim. Okay, yes. we can hear you now. Uh, this was um, <laughs> what we discussed last month um, and sort of got your uh, your blessing to move forward with this process. So these are on uh, in the process of being ordered. We expect them in uh, in early July, but we wanted to get the process going. Um, uh, this is the formal approval of that purchase um, prior to that actually being uh, released. Okay, um, that's we discussed that in the last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions regarding this? Nope. Okay, then may I have a? I'm sorry. Oh, okay, then may may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the. Uh, fiscal year 2020 purchase of 390 Dell Model 3100 Chromebook computers from CWG for the amount of $156,000. I so moved. Thank you, Patty. May I have a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Kit. Roll call, please. Leo. It was Leo. Oh, Leo, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Leo. Okay. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Yes. Peyton Howell. Yes. Rago. Yeah. Yeah, we're here. But you can see. I can't see her. There she is. I think she just joined, Rago. right? Rago. She's waving her hand. Yes. Are you muted? Thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Ramirez. Yes. King Pal Pong. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. Okay. That motion has pa has passed. Uh, we move on to the committee reports. Uh, first one, Bensonville Community Foundation, Juliet and Kit. Is there anything to report? We have Ned had no meetings. Okay. So, no report. So they're not having any virtual meetings either, right? No. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Finance Facilities Committee. There, that's on hold right now. Um, unless Marianne, do you have anything to add? I do not. Okay. Thank you. And then, uh, IASB delegate, uh, just a few things. Um, I just wanted to go over really quickly. I attended the May 7th IASB DuPage division meeting. Um, that's other board members were excuse me, we're in attendance. And um, the big uh, concern at that meeting was the depth of curriculum. That was the big challenge. They were concerned on how uh, curriculum depth was being 
covered in their respective uh, school districts. Uh, property tax income was a, another big concern at, at that meeting from the other districts. Um, it seemed they had lower reserves and were concerned about the income uh, going into the next year. Um, and then how to, um, uh, and that actually ties into what Bruce was saying, was the, 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 there's just a concern on how the tax revenue uh, income is gonna affect the uh, funding for the school districts uh, with what, that ties in with what Bruce, you know, was uh, telling us before. And then uh, another concern was um, communication changes, um, hierarchy and uh, communication flow within the district from superintendent to the board and then out to the community. May 12th, I attended the executive committee meeting. Um, the, what, the big concern there was also uh, curriculum depth, upholding standards, ways to ensure that the most possible uh, of curriculum is being covered. Um, the, um, another item was the resolution season is coming uh, for the Triple I conference in the fall and that, propo that proposed res resolutions at Triple I are due by the end of June. Uh, another item that was discussed was the fall meeting, the topic for the fall meeting. Uh, and but overwhelmingly, everyone agreed that uh, that uh, the COVID-19 uh, education in the COVID-19 season had to be addressed. And we all agreed that we the, the best thing needed was to have a panel to dis to discuss and to address uh, what what has worked and what hasn't and not to resort to story time, to, to just have point blank, uh, address items that, um, uh, that each district, is, that every district is going through and to see what is working and what hasn't. And also that the next spring meeting, um, they're looking for a school district to host the spring meeting and they're looking to change that to Saturday morning. I attended the May 21st uh, IASB DuPage division meeting and there the, the main topic was uh, as James uh, discussed were the three options for the fall in class virtual and a hybrid. There was a lot of concern about uh, going hybrid or uh, going back to in class. But a lot of questions, and as James pointed out, there's absolutely no idea which way this is going to go. Nobody, there's, there's no clear direction. And then also there was the um, continuing question on how that'll work. You know, will every classroom then, have, you know, if we go to a virtual, will every classroom have to be sanitized after each class, you know, after it, after every class? Uh, will the hallways be one way? Um, how is lunch going to work? You know, it can't be in the cafeteria. Will they have to have it in class? You know, bus, you know, there'll be social distancing on the bus. Um, what normally is one bus trip, will, will the, that same bus have to make three bus trips? You know, just the constant issues and items like that. Uh, those were all questions that um, all of the districts were, uh, were wondering about. And then also the same items that Bruce brought up regarding cost, you know, who's gonna bear the cost for the additional sanitation where you have to need uh, additional custodial staff to sanitize the classrooms after each uh, class. Um, and then also another item that came up is that um, there's current leg legislation to add to this, to the three different scenarios, there's, there is legislation that um, there, it will, that um, it may be up to the parents as to which scenario they choose. 
So the district needs to be prepared to possibly have all three scenarios and the parents then decide which one they want for their child. Um, and a lot of that rest with it is because of um, uh, some parents will be working, some won't, and that's to accommodate their uh, situation at home. But that's again up in the air. That's just, uh, there's no clear direction on that yet. Um, and then liability, what kind of liability is there gonna be for the district uh, regarding COVID-19 moving forward? Uh, that's it in a nutshell. There's an upcoming board president virtual meeting on May 28th, which I'll attend. And that's all I have. Um, Len, anything to report on that, James or Leo? It was James. Sure. I wasn't making it. Uh, real quick, we had a LEN meeting on May 15th, a uh, regular meeting there. Uh, basically, um, there were three big parts to it. They recognized the retirees, uh, superintendents who are retiring this year. Uh, they encourage us to plan for the fall semester, as you discussed and I discussed earlier, uh, plan on remote learning come fall, uh, plan on a hybrid uh, program and an in-person. They also basically told us is plan for a... Uh, a flat budget coming from the state uh, for fiscal year uh, 21. That's it. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, Nedsec, Leo and uh, Patty, and okay. congratulations again, Leo, on becoming the chair for Nedsec. Yeah, thank you. I was there and well, I'm going to say congratulations to James too. He's the chairperson for the operation, operational board meeting and I'm with the governing meeting. So it was fun. My first meeting, I get lost and here I am. <laughs> he, he did fine. He was fantastic. Uh, so it, it, this is just a... Uh, uh, a demonstration of uh, the Fenton le leadership in DuPage County. Um, as you all know, the Northern DuPage Special Education Cooperative is, is there's a pro approximately 13 different school districts that feed into it, and Fenton is taking a leadership role. In my part, uh, we had a, a regular board meeting, kind of like what we're doing now on uh, last May 11th, uh, where there's a consent agenda. And some of the stuff in the consent agenda is basically what Leo um, uh, discuss appointment of uh, a new uh, chairperson at the operation board as well as the governing board. Obviously, Leo's in the governing board being a board member here for Fenton, and I'm the new chair for uh, uh, for the operation. Uh, we approved a couple items, for example, uh, pay raises for non-certified staff, approval of an administrators, uh, and so forth. The big takeaway there um, for me is just, you know, uh, for uh, Leo being named uh, the chairperson. So that's my reporting in regards to NEDSEC. It will be a little bit uh, uh, more in depth next time being the, the chair of the, of the board for the operation um, section of, of NEDSEC. Okay, thank you, James. And congratulations to you and both you and Leo. Um, Policy committee, uh, Patty, did you want to say a few words? Sure. Can you hear me? Can yes. You hear me now? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we uh, we met at five thirty today to review uh, twenty policies. Ten of them, um, thanks to Sam, were I mean they he broke it down very nicely. Uh, like uh, five of them, or so, had just footnote changes. Um, five more had, uh, you know, a couple other minute changes, and then we reviewed, um, went through 10 new policies with um, actual changes within the policy and the footnotes, and uh, we are all up to speed. Okay. Um, yep. Was there any particular, no, there wasn't anything that, like, dramatically changed that I need to report on. Was there, James? Just, just to add, Patty, I think you hit everything on, uh, on, 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 the, on the head right there, but this is the first reading. Come June board meeting, we're going to ask the board to approve the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the new policies. Um, so if you have time during this time, we got a month to take a look at it, to look at it again, that would be your second reading. Um, obviously, if there's a question you ask Patty or Sam in particular um, for, for further clarification, we recommend that the board approve uh, these policies um, for the upcoming uh, June board meeting. Okay, thank you, Patty. Thank you, James. So, um, yeah, if we could all just review that and be prepared for that for the next meeting, that would be great. Um, <coughs> speaking of the next board meeting, that'll be on Wednesday, June 24th, 2020 um, at 7 p.m. Does anyone have any new business to discuss? No. Okay. Then uh, we need to go into closed session. So may I have a, a, a motion and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee of a public body that is subject to the local government wage increase transparency act may not be, may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with this act. Five ILCS 120, slash two C one and collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or the representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules scheduled for one or more classes of employees five ILCS one twenty slash two C two. May I have a motion please? I will make the motion. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second, please? I'll second. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howe. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Team Popong. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Rigo. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. All right. The Jimmy next Ray item on the agenda. Hold on, Paul. Just make sure I'm sorry. Jim, Jim Batson, are you ready? <laughs> Jim, Jim, so, so Jim is we're ready. Jim's okay. been there the whole time. <laughs> oh, All right. Yeah. Okay, great. We are back in open session. The next item on the agenda is the Floss Memo of Understanding Contract Extension for one year. And James. Uh, just real quickly, as we discussed uh, for the last uh, month and a half here, uh, I recommend, we recommend to the board uh, as an administrative team to uh, extend the FLOSS uh, contract for one year uh, via mem memo of understanding as presented. Okay, yeah, we discussed that. Anybody have any questions regarding this? No. No, and this is gonna nope. reflect what they said about not having, adding the additional 25 cents. That's correct. Right. Yeah, right. for equity and flattening that, yep. Okay, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the Floss Memo of Understanding contract extension for one year as presented? I motion. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? I will second that. Thank you, Kate. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howe? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Paul Paul? Yes. 
Wingman. Yes. All right, the motion has passed. May I have a motion and a second to adjourn? So I'll like to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. I think Marianne and Jackie. Correct. Okay. Okay, uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howe? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. <laughs> yes. Ramirez? Jackie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's frozen. <laughs> She's frozen. Yes. Galloway? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, that motion has passed. And good night, everyone. Again, thanks. For, it was a long night. James, this is a long day for you. We I appreciate yes. it. James. Okay. Yes, James.